Well, good morning, Christian Family Church. It's so good to be with you this morning. It's been really great for me to stand up here, and I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, which is really great. Some people I haven't seen in a while, so it might be that I just haven't been where they've been here in the services, but it's good to be with you this morning. And for all of those that are in our other venues, thank you so much uh, for joining us. You're very much a part of this service. And also for those of you that are streaming in from online, welcome to our service this morning. Well, it's a great uh, privilege for me to continue on, number one, or finalize the book of James this morning with you. And I'm very grateful, of course, to Apostle Theo and Pastor Bev for every opportunity that I'm afforded to come and share the word with every single one of you and uh, hopefully play a role in enriching your lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that we can gather together and just share in each other's uh, company, Father, and to be in your presence as a body. Thank you, Father God, for your word that is truth and, and living, Father, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, thank you, Lord, that as we come into the conclusion of the book of James, as it is wrapped up this morning, I thank you, Father God, that these words that are spoken go forth in power and that they're planted deep in the hearts of every single person. And that, Lord, a harvest will come forth from these words, not just now, but in the future, years from now, Father. Things that were said today and that were uh, embedded deep in our hearts will continue to produce life in our lives. And I thank you so much for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Are you ready to receive the word this morning? How many of you have enjoyed the series on the book of James? It's been a great series, hey? I mean, it's really brought to light a lot of information. I've read through the book of James so many times. I've referenced it over the years, but really I've not quite seen it in the light that we have experienced over these last nine uh, weeks or nine or ten weeks that we've been looking at the book of James and unpacking it. And up until now, the book of James has been very much a practical book. In fact, it's considered to be one of the most practical books in the New Testament, in the Bible, as a matter of fact, and, and helps us with, with things that we can implement in our lives. And, uh, you know, we've dealt with wisdom. We've dealt with not treating people uh, uh, unfairly or with a disrespect We've spoken about taming the tongue. These are things that we can implement. We've spoken, we started right up front with, with talking about God's word being the word of truth and, and that we can trust his word. And so we've really spoken about a lot of things and, and hopefully we've begin to, we've really thought about them and not just heard them and, and thought it was great at the time, but, but thought about them and, and considered things. And, and perhaps the Lord has actually spoken to you about a couple of things, and, and you've begun to, to put them into practice in your lives. And, and really, it, it is something that we can implement. But now, as we come to the end, the last part of chapter 5 of the book of James, there's a bit of a twist that happens now in the end. Because everything, as I said, has, has mostly been practical. Things that we can put into practice in our lives and improve on. But now what happens is James, with this twist, he goes into a very spiritual angle, or he looks at it from a very spiritual point of view. And so I'm going to pick it up in James chapter 5, verses 13, really continuing on immediately from where Pastor Johnny would have left it off last week. So James says this, he says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Now, pause there for a moment. If you think about that, if you had read this scripture maybe two years ago, yeah, it's easy for us to say, yes, uh, okay, you know, people, we face trouble and that sort of thing. But when one reads it in the light of what's happening around us today, and you see, it says, is anyone among you in trouble? The whole world is in trouble at the moment, James. The whole world is in, I mean, I've never seen the world being in trouble in my lifetime as I am seeing it now. So for sure, if the world's in trouble, then yes, all of us are facing trouble. So thanks for that, James. But certainly we, we, we can say that we're in a bit of trouble. And, and the sad thing about you know, what we've been facing over these last uh, year and a half, basically, is that all the bad things are up. Seriously, all the bad things are up. Divorce is up. Depression is up. Suicide is up. Addiction is up. And these are things that are typical of a crisis situation, the kind of things that, that you would experience. And it is very sad. 
But let's notice what his answer is to this very real question. James says, let them pray. Now, I know many might at this point say, oh, well, well, there you go. There you go, Paul. Really? Is that the best that you're going to do? You're going to come up and tell me that I need to pray? I mean, that just seems like such a a Christian cliche. If you're having a trouble, uh, just pray about it. And, um, And some people might even say, look, Paul, you don't understand, I have been praying. And, uh, and it doesn't seem to be working for me. Has anybody ever been at that kind of place? But here's what I want you to do. I want you to lean in with new ears this morning. Because five times James mentions this word in the next portion of Scripture that we're going to read. Five times. He says this. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church to do what? To pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Now, up until now, we've tried everything else, perhaps, in the first five chapters that we've looked at in the book of James. But you know, sometimes we just need God to insert himself into a situation. When there really isn't much more that we can do, that's when we have to just step back or or step close to God and allow Him to do what only God can do. And He says, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and do what? Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person, James says, is powerful. And He says that it is effective. So now, why this focus on prayer? Why are we focusing, or why is James focusing so strongly on prayer? Because there are some things that we can learn from Scripture, as I've already elaborated on this morning, and we can apply, and and we can all get better. In fact, God tells us that we should work out our salvation. He really expects us to do things in our lives to work out our salvation. There are things that, that we're required to do. We can make decisions. We can improve our lives. We can tame our tongue. We can make decisions about how we're going to treat people and how we're going to give and the, and the way that we're going to do that. We can do that. But all of us also face things that in all of our attempts, it simply isn't enough. And that's why we pray. Listen to this wonderful definition of prayer. Prayer is the difference between the best that I can do and the best that God can do. Prayer is the difference between the best that I can do because we have to try our best and the best that God can do. You know, this ministry is founded on prayer. I'm sure many of us are aware of the testimony when the the church was planted back in the 1970s. Apostle Theo, for the first few years, he spent time praying every day. He, in fact, he rented an office, and he rented it so that he could go to it and pray. And that was what he did. That was his, his 9 to 5 job at the time when the church started. So this ministry has been built on prayer, and it is sustained on prayer. Prayer is a very important part, a critical aspect of this ministry even today. And you know what? It will continue to be a very important part of this ministry. The success of this ministry and and all of the churches that have planted out of this and the myriad of people that have come and gotten born again and, and, you know, gone in different ways or have remained here, all of that is as a result of prayer. How many of you can agree with that? And so let me just share something with you a little closer to home, something that I experienced in my life in in the early 2000s. I, um, at the time, I was a software trainer. That was my profession. In fact, back then, I was doing it as a consultant for about four years, and I I would go to different companies and get uh, some contracts and and train at different companies. And at the same time, I was also heading up 
a ministry at the church when we were back in Ellensfontein called the Computer Training Ministry. And so what I did there is I, I taught people how to use computers for about five years. Every Saturday we'd get together and I had a little program developed and, and I would move people through that and get them computer literate. And, and back in the 2000s, I can tell you that the, the computer illiteracy scale was far greater than, than what it is today. Anyhow, I was quite concerned about where I was headed as far as my own future was concerned and my career, and I'd been through a couple of tough months where you know, there weren't that, those many contracts, and, and sometimes I would be at home more days than I would be at work in a given month. So it was, it was distressing for me, and, and I was concerned about that, and so you know, I tried to, to get more contracts, I tried to market myself better, but it was just a, a difficult time, and one that, as I say, was very concerning for me, especially, you know, I wasn't sure where this was actually heading. And uh, so I, I believe that what I needed to do is I needed to spend time really seriously praying and also fasting. I, in my heart, I just knew that I needed to fast, and I wasn't really a faster. And, uh, and the Lord showed me in the book of, of uh, Esther uh, how they went into a three-day dry fast. And so when I saw that, I thought, well, that's what God's telling me to do. And so that's what I did is I decided I'm going to lock myself away. I'm going to fast and pray and, and do just like they did in the book of Esther. And that's what I did. And I, I prayed earnestly in a, uh, concerning what am I to do going forward? Do I continue in, in this way? Or, or is there something else that you've got for me? Should I be looking around? What do you want me to do, Lord? And on the third day, Sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? On the third day, while I was in our spare room praying, it was during the day, uh, in my heart, a scripture was like echoed in my heart. And it was the scripture 3 John 1 5. I just, as I was praying, boom, there it was 3 John 1 5. I need to read 3 John 1 5. So I went to my Bible. It was a New King James spiritual Bible at the time that I was using. And I page to 3 John 1 5. And this is what it says. In that scripture, it says, Beloved, you do faithfully what you do for the brethren and for strangers. Now, for me, that was like, this is what God was saying. Beloved, it was great that he called me beloved. I really appreciated that. But the fact that God said, you do faithfully what you do for the brethren, I knew that had to do with the ministry that I was running and for strangers. And I knew that that had to do with what I was doing as a, a profession. And so there I had the answer to, to this very distressing question of mine that I should just continue on in doing what it is that I was doing. And I was satisfied. In fact, it was a marvelous relief to hear these words from the Lord. There was a great comfort in that. And so I did. I just carried on and, you know, the rest is, is history, as they say. But that was a time where I had to turn to prayer, earnest prayer, and trust God through that because there was really nothing else that I could do. Now, James, he comes along here, yeah, and after every practical thing that he has given us, he says, listen, if you have trouble still, then you should pray. And, uh, and so I want to talk to us about three truths that James shows us in this book concerning prayer. The first one is this, that prayer, prayer puts my unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. Prayer puts my unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. You see, the problem, because he's saying if any of you has trouble, the problem with the problem is not necessarily the problem itself. The problem with the problem is where is it going? Where is this problem going to end up? In my situation, it had to do with my job and what I was doing. The problem for me was where am I going? That was the major concern, not what I was doing at the time, but really, where am I going? Am I heading down a dead end here? If you're having trouble in your marriage, for example, yes, I mean, we all have uh, uh, upsets in our marriage, and, but the problem with any trouble that you may be having in your marriage is where is this thing going? And you know, as well as I do, that it can, can end up very bad. It can turn out to be a very bad thing. So, so what we need to do, as far as our future in the trouble that we're facing right now is concerned, James says we should pray. If anyone is in trouble, let them pray. Now he's also saying, or what he's not saying is that God's probably not going to tell you how he's going to fix whatever it is that you're dealing with or how he's going to solve it. But what you need to know is that God is at work. And you just need to know that. 
So I think a lot of people today, and I sometimes have to include myself in that as well, a lot of people today have no confidence in the fact that God is actually doing something. And that, you know, they perhaps have lost their confidence that God is doing something that they know absolutely nothing about. And we just need to trust that He is at work. But we serve a God who is what? An all-knowing God. And you need to understand this as well, families, that God is not pacing heaven right now. He's never paced the floors of heaven. He's not wondering, oh my goodness, how are we going to deal with this this twist in the tale of humanity uh, that came about in, the late, in late 2019. How are we going to deal with this? He's not pacing the floors of heaven. We may pace the floors of our rooms and, and we may pace the halls in our minds on how is God going to do this? Where are we going to from here? What does our future look like? How many of you would agree that there was a time where really we did, I didn't even know what going to the shop was going to be like? Do you remember that when it first happened? I mean, Elaine, she went to, she was the first one in our household to go to the shop when the strong lockdown happened. Yeah, mask and everything was just, we didn't know what to expect. And it's like, okay, honey, just be, you know, be careful. I hope there's no roadblocks on the way and body searches and all sorts of things like that. I mean, we didn't know what to expect. And when she came back, we were all waiting outside, you know, okay, how was it? What happened? You know, how many police were there? Did, what? We didn't know. It was very uncertain, our future. In fact, even now at times, it still is. But James is saying pray because our unknown future is placing that in the hands of an all-knowing God. Praise the Lord. So God's not pacing the floors of heaven. We can do a bit of pacing and rest in the fact that he knows and he has a plan and he is at work. And that's why, I mean, Jesus had, if I could almost say it like this, had the audacity In Matthew chapter 6, to say these words to us. So do not worry, Jesus said. Saying, what shall we eat or or drink or what shall we wear? All of these everyday life challenges. Jesus is saying, don't worry about that. Look what he says. says, For the pagans run after these things. Who are the pagans? The pagans are people who don't have a God. Jesus is saying, people who don't have a God, they worry about stuff like this. But you have a God. You don't have to worry about this. He says, your heavenly father knows that you need these things, but seek first his kingdom. Jesus is saying, seek him, pray to him and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, he says it again, do not worry about tomorrow. And we might say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know. I have no idea how you're going to get us out of this pickle. But you know what, Lord, I don't have to know how you're going to do it because your kingdom come, your will be done. We just have to trust in that. The second thing that James teaches us about prayer is that prayer puts my hopeless situation in the hands of an all-powerful God. Say that. Say, prayer puts my hopeless situation in the hands of an all-powerful God. You know, even things that seem like there is just no possible way to fix it. Perhaps you have something in your life right now where if you had to try and, if you had to answer an examination to say, is there a way out of this? You're going to say, no, there is just no way out of this. I've thought about this. I've stayed up at nights trying to think about how we're going to get out of this. And I can't come up with a solution. There is no way out of this. It's hopeless. Let me be a bit transparent with you. I'm facing something that is hopeless at the moment. I've been facing it for a long time, and it's still hopeless. It feels hopeless. Sometimes it drives me crazy. Perhaps someday I can tell you about it. That day won't be today, though. You might say to me, Paul, you know what? If you had to preach this message two years ago, maybe then. But the problem, Paul, is with a message like this, you're too late. You're too late. I'm sorry. Let me tell you something. It's never too late for a God who can raise the dead. It's never too late for a God like that. Do you serve a God like that? Well, then it's never too late. James says in in verse 14, talking about a hopeless situation, he says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call to the elders of the church 
To do what? To pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. Are you in a hopeless situation? I, I know that there are people that are facing right now hopeless situations. And, uh, and even, you know, what the doctors are saying. There's no hope in what they're saying. But James is saying, no, you put this in the hands of an all-powerful God and he can turn this into a very hopeful situation. Let's remind ourselves about Abraham just for a moment in, in Romans 4.18. It says, even when there was no reason for hope, the Bible says, Abraham kept doing what? He kept hoping, believing that he would uh, uh, become the father of a multitude. Why? Because God had told him, you are going to have descendants more than you can count. And, and Abraham's faith, it didn't weaken, even though at about 100 years old, his body was already dead and his wife, Sarah, her, her womb had dried up and it was closed for a long time already. His reproductive system hadn't been functioning for, for years already. But that didn't matter to Abraham. His faith did not weaken, the Bible says. And uh, it says, Abraham never wavered in believing God. I wish I could make statements like that about myself. But even if we do waver, it's not too late. And it says, in fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, uh, he brought glory to God. He was what? He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. We need to get ourselves to the point. And as far as God's concerned, it's possible to get ourselves to the point where we are fully convinced. For myself, I'm not there yet. But I'm working towards it. It's possible for us to get to a point where we are fully convinced. We just have to keep at it. You know, in 1964, my mom began to pray for someone that was very close to her. She prayed for their salvation. At the time, this person was in prison. So the situation didn't look very good. But she was determined to pray for them to get saved. And her and my father, they you know, took it upon themselves and they prayed for them and over the years. And, and when they were invited to visit, you know, eventually they were and not in prison anymore. They were released. Um, but you know, this person had a real problem with the drink. And, and sometimes when they were invited over for, for a bra or what have you, my dad would actually end up braying because you know, this person that was near and close to them was in no condition to man a pair of tongs behind a deadly fire, you know. And they persevered. And in the, in the mid-80s, they got gloriously saved. It took 20 years of prayer and persistence. But they got saved. And, and they've since gone on to be with the Lord. But their eternity is set in God. Because they were determined to stick to their guns and to pray and trust that God could save this person. Even when it looked like this, this is the one person God can't save. But he saved them. And today he's rejoicing in heaven with so many others that have joined him. And, uh, and what a great miracle. The trick is we have to stay steadfast. Now the third thing that James tells us is that he, uh, or uh, teaches us is that prayer puts my broken life in the hands of an all-forgiving God. Prayer puts my broken life in the hands of an all-forgiving God. Because James says in, in chapter 5 verses 15, If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and do what? Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, which begs the question, if the kinds of prayers that God listens to are from a righteous person, who is righteous? It's a good question, right? No one is righteous. The Bible says there is no one righteous. No, not one. But here's the good news is that you can become a righteous person. What is a righteous person? A righteous person is someone whose wrongs have been made right. So how do I get my wrongs to be made right? I'll tell you in 2 Corinthians 5. In Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. 
So that's available for you today. In fact, this might be the most important decision that you make or the most important prayer that you pray today. Thank God, yes, for our futures. Thank God that, that uh, you know, he can handle my impossible situation. But the best part of our God, James says, is that you can come with your broken life and God can make it right. Because all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is nothing, there is no brokenness in your life that God cannot fix. And then James does this interesting thing. He tells the story of Elijah. He says in, in verse 17, after talking about these things of prayer, he tells the story of Elijah and he says, Elijah, knowing full well that Elijah is considered to be the greatest prophet that has ever lived. And he's using him as an example, okay, for prayer. So he says, Elijah was as human or as a human being as what we are. He was as much a human as what we are. Now, James knew that he was setting himself up for this because people would say, yeah, right, Elijah, thank you very much. That's Elijah. Of course, God listens to Elijah. It's Elijah, for goodness sake, not little old me. But he was sure to say, listen, he was as human as what you are. He was no different than what you are. And he said that, uh, uh, he, said that he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. James is relaying the story of Elijah, not only to teach us how to pray, but, to, but also how to have effective faith, how to have faith that actually works. And so if we look at, at 1 Kings, where Elijah, where this story happens that he's recounting, we see that Elijah the Tishbite, he said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, this is the start of the three and a half year drought that he spoke this. But it didn't just begin because Elijah said so. He had a word. Elijah had a word. God had spoken to him that it would not rain. Elijah was carrying this thing that God had said to him around with him all the time. And that's how faith works. Faith starts with a word. Can you say that? Say, faith starts with a word. So how do you get a word? You get a word by going to the word. If you want your faith to grow, you're going to need a word. And you get a word from God by being in God's word. Are you reading your Bible, folks? Are you reading your Bible? If you're not, you're not going to have faith. And, and if you don't have faith, your prayers are not going to work. And if your prayers don't work, then it's going to be all up to you. But if you don't want it to be up to you and you want God to help, then you're going to need to pray. But when you pray, you're going to need faith. And if you need faith, you're going to have to find it in God's Word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing why or how? By the Word of God. When I was drowning in depression and felt like God was done with me, like He didn't want anything to do with me. I was in the ministry at the time. I thought, no, God's over. You know, I've just messed it up too bad. He gave me a word. I've called you back. And it's Isaiah 41.9. I've called you back from the ends of the earth saying, you are my servant. For I've chosen you and I will not throw you away. What about the pandemic, Paul, you might be asking? I have a word for you. Psalm 91. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and pro protect you from deadly disease. You might say, Paul, what about my job? I have a word for you, Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. Maybe someone says, what about our political situation here in the country? I mean, that's pretty messed up, Paul. What about that? I have a word for you. Psalm 121 verses 1. I look up to the mountains, David says, the hills. We could say like this, the union buildings, okay? Longing for God's help. But David says, then I realize that our true help and protection come only from the Lord. Our creator who made the heavens and the earth, he will guard and guide me, never letting me stumble or fall. You have to get a word. Elijah, he said to Ahab, go and eat and drink. There's a storm coming. There's a monsoon on its way. You better hurry. He instead went up into Mount Carmel to pray. Why did he go to Mount Carmel to pray on a perfectly clear day? 
because God had told Elijah that it was going to rain on a perfectly clear day. What did Elijah do? He went and prayed earnestly. The Bible says that he put his face between his knees. Sometimes we need to change our posture when the urgency comes. Not texting someone or or, or Googling for help. We need to just really put our face between our knees and, and pray like Elijah did. God had given him the word. And on a perfectly clear day, he was up praying because God had said it's going to rain. So what was Elijah teaching us? That on a clear sunny day, when you know there's supposed to be rain coming because God told you rain was coming, that faith builds when you determine not to give up. We have to determine not to give up. What did he do with his servant? Seven times he told the servant, go and look. When he came back each time, he said, sorry, Elijah, there's there's nothing. I'm looking out, there's nothing. It's just beautiful, clear sky. What did Elijah say? Go back. You might say to me, Paul, but I've tried praying. Go back. Yes, but I've been praying for eight years, Paul. Go back. On the seventh time, the servant came back with this report. He said, look, Elijah, I mean, it's not much, but it's something. At least there's a cloud the size of your hand. And he said, it's coming, boy, it's coming. Go tell Ahab he needs to buckle. And then he tucked his cloak into his belt, the Bible says, and he balegat, the Spirit of God. It says here, it says, uh, uh, the power of God, the power of the Lord came upon Elijah and he kajimat like he never kajimat in his life before. And he ran faster than a horse. A monsoon formed on a crystal clear day. A man runs faster than a horse. You'd say to me, Paul, that's impossible. You're right, it is impossible. With man, it is impossible, but not with God. Jesus said, Amen. Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then to close off the book of James, he ends in the most unique way with the greatest miracle of all. He says in verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. James is saying, listen, I hope that your impossible situation works out. And I hope that your unknown future, that you get a grasp and and some confidence in it. And I hope that you experience the power of God. But even if you don't, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is not that everything works out here on earth, but that everyone ends up in heaven. That's the most important thing. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.